I guess let's kind of just dive right into it. Will you kind of explain um, what the task force that you started, what, what the point of it is, and kind of what the goals are? Well, I was appointed by Leader McCarthy to be the chairman of the, of the China task force. Uh, and I, I will say we've been working uh, closely with the Democrats to do a bipartisan um, task force on China uh, going back a year ago. And um, unfortunately, um, they decided to back out for whatever reason. We still uh, uh, have an extended hand to, uh, I want, we want this to be bipartisan. So I'm hopeful that we'll have, you know, uh, you know, Democrats who are interested in this issue. I understand, uh, you know, look at the president and the response, but we also have to look at the origination of COVID-19, how it happened, why it happened, and how we can stop it from happening in the future. We also have to examine things like supply chain coming out of uh, China and in terms of medical supply. I think the big eye-opener to a lot of Americans who are so dependent on China for our supply chain when it comes to medical supplies, uh, pharmaceuticals, um, and also um, the technology piece, supply chain, which I think really could impact Austin here. Um, had a lot of good discussions with uh, Leader McCarthy about finding ways to incentivize and bring our the semiconductor, highly sophisticated chip, um, you know, out of, uh, of you know areas under the Chinese Communist Party's domination, bring them uh, back to manufacturing um, in the United States and Austin is really kind of in my district is really the home for many of these high tech companies, whether it be Samsung, whether it be Apple, uh, whether it be Intel or IBM in my district. So I think we've got a good opportunity to create a lot of manufacturing jobs right here in Austin and bring that supply chain out. To me, that's a good foreign policy. So the task force will be looking, you know, at that issue, we'll be looking at uh, uh, China's um, um, military posture in the South China Sea. We'll be looking at their human rights abuses that take place daily um, against their own people and the people of Hong Kong and Taiwan. We'll also be uh, looking at the role of the uh, Chinese Communist Party in turn, and the government in terms of uh, infiltrating the United Nations to get key positions, including the World Health Organization uh, that Director General Tegros heads up. Um, we believe that um, he was complicit with the Chinese government and this cover-up that had it been exposed and had they been more transparent, Maggie, um, and we had, you know, it goes to the, the, the detaining of the doctors, not allowing them to speak the truth about what was happening with this SARS-like virus, uh, to going into labs, destroying lab samples, and then finally not admitting it's human-to-human -human transmission, all the while big uh, festival going on in China, millions of people traveling, then internationally, then you went from an epidemic to a global pandemic. Um, we'll be looking at all these issues in a wide variety of all issues related to uh, China, and, and not the people of China are great people, it's a great culture, it's the Chinese Communist Party they're victim to. And we anticipate we'll release, release this report on October the 1st, uh, it'll be very comprehensive, and also with legislative recommendations. So, so the task force isn't just focused on COVID-19 related issues, it's also kind of just like a greater, a larger investigation into China and kind of what we can, how we can benefit from making maybe changes, is that, is that right? Right, I think it's gonna be COVID-19 centric in terms of the investigation into the origins and what went wrong and why did the World Health Organization fail and it's number one mission in reporting what became a global pandemic. But I think we're also going to have to look at our foreign policy uh, with China. Uh, we have to look at being more competitive with China. Uh, we're going to be looking at, you know, this is a technology town. We're going to be looking at issues like artificial intelligence, cyber, quantum computing, and 5G, which is a telecom space that, you know, in many respects, the Chinese, they're either, uh, they're either, um, catching up to us or they're surpassing us. And I think the race for 5G uh, in, in quantum as well is gonna be, unlike the space race, a, a digital space race. And I think it's, this is a generation, a generational issue. I believe that, uh, you know, my father uh, fought the you know, Nazis in World War II. We had the Cold War, we had radical Islamists after 
for this generation, now this is the issue. I believe that the Chinese government, the PRC, is now becoming the, the number one long-term threat to the national security of the United States. Interesting. So you said in the past that you believe China actually broke international law. Will you kind of explain why you believe this and what you think the, the punishment should be, any ramifications that they should face? Well, so remember, uh, we had the SARS outbreak, and that became actually a pandemic. Um, uh, not nearly as wide a scale as this one or the Spanish flu in 1918. After SARS broke out, um, you know, there, there was a concern that we'd have another SARS-like virus break out, which is exactly what COVID-19 is. So we put uh, the World Health Organization through the international community, including the United States, put into, um, it put into place certain guidelines and recommendations and rules, if you will, um, that if any country had a SARS-like virus, it needed to report that to the WHO within 24 hours. Uh, the investigation we have conducted reveals that they were aware of this going back to December into January. Um, it was never properly reported. And, and in fact, the WHO uh, actually were complicit with the, the Chinese government, the Communist Party, in, in failing to, to present this to the world that it was highly infectious and it was human to human transmittable. That, could alone, had we known that, had they been more transparent, um, by most universities' accounts, would have could have contained this just possibly and stopped this global pandemic that's caused so much loss of life, life and economic chaos. Do you think what what would we find out then if we if we were able to confirm that they knew about it before the world's really kind of got wind of it? What would be like the punishments that they would face? Well, the only way you can you know every nation's sovereign, but the best way to attack it, and I've talked to a lot of uh, the international community ambassadors of our NATO allies, our European allies, um, the Five I countries, you know, like Australia, um, about how can the international community. First of all, bring a team of scientists into Wuhan to find out what happened. But secondly, deal with China, uh, I should say the government, in a responsible manner to hold them accountable for what they have done. Uh, so we were looking at a variety of issues that would come out with the task force, including sanctions, uh, which the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee works on, sanctions on those responsible for the cover-up. I refer to this as the worst cover up in human history that's caused devastating uh, consequences. And we kind of touched on this before, but when, when you were talking about the fact that no Democrats have officially signed on to this yet, um, but you're still kind of hoping that maybe some will down the road, um, what do you think the task force can achieve without bipartisan support? Well, we welcome bipartisanship. In fact, uh, I talked to Leader McCarthy today, we want um, you know, people across the aisle to join us who are interested in this issue. As I look at COVID-19, there are really two facets. One would be the, the response efforts here in the United States. And that, that like any crisis, like 9-11 or hurricanes, we always do, you know, lessons learned after that. But we absolutely need to do a foreign policy examination of our relationship, uh, you know, with the Chinese government and the PRC and the role that they played in the pandemic with COVID-19. To do otherwise, I think is a great disservice to the American people. I think the American people, majority of them want this, 70, 80% want uh, an investigation into what happened and also hold them accountable for what they did. What do you think is holding Democrats back right now from joining this task force? Well, I talked to many privately, including my chairman, Chairman Engel, who when we talked about um, examining the United Nations, WHO role and the Chinese Communist Party, uh, he believes that's within the jurisdiction of our committee. He is willing to move forward. I, I think it's more of his leadership and I don't quite understand it. Um, but again, we offer you know uh, participation for anybody on the other side who wants to join. I think we are, Maggie, going to get uh, you know um, some national security experts and there are many of them, very good friends of mine across the aisle, who I work with on a daily basis in the Congress that I think will 
be a part of this unless the top of their leadership um, censors them from doing so. How do you respond to criticism um, that this move is kind of just a political exercise? I think it's political not to examine it. I think it's political to only examine the president, his response, and then turn a blind eye to the very cause, you know, root cause of where this came from and how it happened. So I think you need to do, to be honest and fair, you need to examine both. Um, and I think not to examine this is a complete abdication of responsibility and disservice to the American people. Um, I don't want this to be a partisan task force. I want it to be a bipartisan task force. I think that adds more strength to the task force, but if they're not gonna join us, then I have to do my duty and conduct you know, my responsibilities as chairman now of this task force to get this done. Um, you know, the Congress is gonna expire and the American people deserve a report and legislative recommendations and a report that tells the truth about what happened. Because right now we don't know. And we may never know because we know right now that President Xi is not allowing anybody on the outside, anybody from the international community to have access to Wuhan to find out what happened. You mentioned earlier that you were going to be releasing an official letter maybe by October 1st. Um, are there any kind of next steps immediately that you see happening with this task force, or do you have any type of like plan over the next few months? How's that looking? Well, it's going to be a comprehensive report on October 1st. I hope it's going to be utilized by experts, you know, by um, the administration, by policy, foreign policy experts uh, to dictate what is our foreign policy with China moving forward. In, in the next several decades. I think this is going to be a very valuable document with, with le legislative uh, recommendations. This uh, task force encompasses almost every committee in the House. So it involves, you know, uh, you know, multiple jurisdictions across, you know, multiple committees, drawing on the expertise of, of the members of Congress and their staff who have been, you know, studying this issue for quite some time. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, really in a bipartisan way because we view that uh, this uh, Chinese, their malign activities, the, uh, the party and their government is malign. Um, so I, I'm going to draw on their expertise. A lot of this work has been done. We're going to put it together, put it in a report. Um, and I think it's going to be a great educational piece. We're also going to be looking, Maggie, at their infiltration of our universities, you know, through the Thousand Talents program. We had three scientists at the University of Texas MD, An MD Anderson that were fired because of potential espionage. We had a Harvard professor who is now indicted you know, for espionage. Um, we know that that's active uh, as well. And we're also gonna look again, as I mentioned, the human rights abuses that take place with the Uyghur Muslim population to the Tibetan monks and the Dalai Lama and, and the uh, oppressive Dictatorship. I think at the end of the day, you're, you're going to be looking at a geopolitical balance of nations that have free and free freedom and democracies versus nations that are dictatorships, authoritarian, and oppress their own people. And that would be Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, Assad, Maduro, and then you got the United States and our allies that stand for freedom and democracy. That's what this whole thing boils down to.